on my shoulder. That's not a job. That's a welt. Is that true? Yeah. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is back and chock full of moments like this. Although it might be weird to understand this if you've been a longtime viewer of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, the TV show is actually some people's first encounter with the series, and it truly does not disappoint. Whether you are a newcomer or a Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared veteran, I think we can all agree that there was a lot to unpack this season, so let's just get straight into it and talk about each episode's deeper meaning and how all of this ties into what may be a larger overarching story. Now, don't worry if you haven't watched the show already, as I'm going to be giving giving a thorough summary of each episode, going in and analyzing and explaining the significance of all the scenes in each one and why they matter to the theme and overall plot of the series. Again, before we proceed, spoilers. Don't watch this if you want to watch the series and enjoy it for the first time ever. Right before we get into that though, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve was nice enough to offer an insane 50% off any one item, plus free shipping in the United States and Canada. You will only get that 50% off if you use discount code THEORIST. So head over to adamandeve.com if you want something to spice up your love life or even spice up your special alone time. They've got it all. Products for men, women, and couples. And if you don't feel like getting anything for that special time, they also have tons of self-care products. And who doesn't love taking care of themselves? Treat yourself today by using code THEORIST and thanks to adamandeve.com for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get into episode one of the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared TV show. Episode one, Jobs. This episode should be seen as a commentary on the hierarchy in the workplace and likewise maintaining a social status quo. Right when the episode begins, we get our first Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared moment with the theme song for the show. As you watch the entire series, you'll come to find out that every iteration of the theme song in each episode is actually a little bit different, with most of them including at least one disturbing type of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared moment. For example, in episode one's intro, we get this odd moment. The camera work gets progressively shaky, the music stops being in tune with the lyrics, and just flat out comes to a halt once the duck starts speaking. Then it suddenly shifts away from the awkward moment we just had to finish out the rest of the song. As I said before, this will be a running gag, if you will, to the series, but like many things in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, it is done with purpose, but let's touch on that later. This episode starts out with Duck asking Red Guy what they are supposed to be doing, and Red Guy proceeds to check their schedule, and he's surprised to find out that they have nothing planned for today. Then, in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared fashion, a talking briefcase begins teaching them the wonders of finding a job. Now, while Yellow Guy and Duck are very enthusiastic about finding a job to pursue, Red Guy admits that he'd very much rather do nothing than find a job. In response to this, the briefcase brings up his brother, unemployed Brendan, using them as an example of why you would not want to be unemployed. Unemployment in this episode is shown as something that's very negative, with it being the most bottom of the bottom that you can get on the social hierarchy, and it's on full display during this scene with the briefcase's brother. In a fit of rage, Unemployed Brendan gets irritated and rages at the fact that his own brother only refers to him as unemployed when speaking to him, implying that the briefcase sees his brother as nothing more than a lazy unemployed brat. This is further emphasized when Brendan asks if someone will publish his novel, which is a classic trope of unemployed people. Although not everyone is out there making novels when they're unemployed, I think it's a classic choice to try and take up some other side hustle or hobby while you're unemployed in an effort to show your unemployed friends that you're not simply wasting your time. Despite the fact that taking time away from work can be a good thing for one's mental health and I honestly really promote that idea. Obviously I don't think you should be unemployed for a very long time without some kind of safety net, but I don't think unemployment should be seen as something that's 
negative. I think it should be welcomed and you know, everyone's situation is different. I personally saw this part as a commentary on hustle culture and how the pressure from people like the briefcase will make others like unemployed Brendan take up something like writing a novel in order to demonstrate that they aren't completely worthless. This is exemplified by the desperation in unemployed Brennan's voice when they ask if someone can publish the novel. Are you gonna publish my novel? It's almost as if they're begging someone to do it so they can prove to their brother that they are worth something and not just an unemployed waste of space. After this moment passes, we get to the meat of the episode. The trio ends up in a warehouse setting where the rest of the episode will take place. The briefcase then mysteriously makes their way out of the shot and completely disappears. Now for this next part to make sense, keep in mind the briefcase just did a whole song and musical number about the wonders of finding a job. You could be literally anything you want and he's promising the trio all of these wonders once they get a job. Now when you actually see what job they get, it's just a typical warehouse job. So I actually feel like this part with the briefcase mysteriously leaving was actually done on purpose. I took it as a metaphor for how some jobs, at least in America, will have requirements and job duties listed, and then when you actually get the job, you're doing something completely different than what you were promised in the interview or anything leading up to your accepting the offer for whatever job you got. In the prior musical number, the briefcase was telling them about how they could be an astronaut or a famous soccer player, but suddenly they're working in a warehouse ready to do physical labor instead of chasing their aspirations and dreams. The briefcase plays the role of the employer that led them on with massive incentives and job requirements on the surface, and yet they end up with a job that is completely unlike what they were promised from the very get-go. Amidst the confusion on where the briefcase went, the red guy goes to answer this phone that's in this office because no one seems to be willing to do it, while the other two-thirds of the trio figure out where they stand in the workplace. Now before we analyze the next few scenes, I wanted to say that as someone who has actually worked in like three or four different warehouses in his lifetime, this episode is dangerously accurate to how monotonous and almost robotic like socializing and work can be in average workplaces like this. The banter right here specifically made me cringe from how accurate it was because I swear I've had this conversation with a few people at work before. What are you doing? We're making bits and parts. Although sometimes I feel a bit like the parts are making me. Oh, that <laughs> makes me laugh. <laughs> Yep, I'm a bit of a cheeky guy sometimes. Yeah, Yellow guy begins figuring out how to do his job properly, which is to basically form these metal balls into quality parts. The entire job is just checking for quality parts or for faulty parts. This is important to note that this machine filters out faulty and quality parts as this will come into play near the end of the episode. Yellow guy fits right in and will serve as what I think to be the average working person in workplaces such as this one. The kind of person that just does what they are told and tries their best to fit in with the crowd. Duck, on the other hand, in my opinion, will serve as the audience's voice, questioning why they are even there to begin with and why his friends suddenly believe they truly work there when literally one minute ago they were just at home doing nothing. The duck tries his hat at making parts and fails spectacularly. He is then asked to help this man create a website. Afterwards, he sees Yellow Guy receive a helmet, which angers him as he was not offered a helmet and considers himself to be smarter than everyone there, so he tries to forcefully take Duncan's helmet, which is this guy with the website, and it leads to this horrific moment. I've got the most valuable brain. Mm. Here, give me yours. Ah! That's this small brain-like figure freaking out might refer to how mentally taxing these types of workplaces like Amazon can have on the human psyche. You can even see Duncan literally going crazy on his computer screen, continuously writing his name over and over again as he is supposed to be working on the website for the company. This part is quickly interrupted by lunchtime, and this is where I feel like someone at Don't Hug Me I'm Scared had to have worked at a place like this because I'm telling you guys, this, it's painfully accurate, okay? That's why the, that's why this is titled Painfully Accurate, because I feel like a lot of these episodes, I feel like almost every single one of them touches on something that I've dealt with myself. 
Again, having worked at three big warehouses, I can say with confidence that at every single one, there were these vendor slash vending machine walls that a lot of people would basically buy their lunch out of. Obviously, no one is forcing you to buy food or eat from one of these, but when you're working like 40 plus hours a week doing hard labor, it's tough to find the will to prepare meals every day without a spouse or partner at home to help you out. So most workers resort to simply eating the exact same processed food from these paywalls. I believe this idea is most represented in this line of the song that accompanies the vending machine's appearance. Vending In complete contrast to those at the bottom of the workplace totem pole, we have Red Guy, who despite doing a low effort task of just simply answering the phone, he has been awarded the manager position, and he finds himself quite literally in an echo chamber of a room, filled with entities that constantly reassure him that his status in the workplace is no mistake and that he deserves this job. I feel like I don't really need to explain this one, but for the kiddos watching at home, it's quite common, at least from a more American workplace, for the manager you're working under to have gotten their job by either you know, simply lying or just doing very low effort work and ended up gaining that position out of sheer seniority. They just happen to be in the right place at the right time, much like our friend the red guy. The rest of the episode from here on out just echoes the points that I've already laid out before, with Red Guy being constantly reassured that he's the boss and is to be treated with the utmost importance. Even getting a meal with literal diamonds on top. Duck is the guy at the job that questions why they were doing such menial tasks and sees everything for what it is, and Yellow Guy remains his go with the flow self, adapting and fitting in wherever he goes. Duck eventually gets fed up and confronts Red Guy about why they haven't left yet, even getting super meta with it, citing that it's been merely nine minutes. This place. What do you want? I'm busy. Busy? What are you talking about? We've only been here for nine minutes. Hang on a sec. Red Guy remains in character, being a super patronizing boss, even insulting Duck's word choice over the lanyard that he is wearing. Is that a lanyard? What? No. <laughs> this is a laminated tag. The lanyard itself is the fabric for stooning it. I thought everyone knew that. What have that. they done to you? Again, Duck, serving as the audience voice, gets frustrated with how superior Red Guy is making himself out to be. And in true manager fashion, Red Guy explains that he is busy and doesn't have time for whatever issues Duck has because they can't possibly be more important than the menial tasks that Red Guy has laid out for the day. Duck then claims that the Red Guy doesn't do anything but answer the phone and anyone can do that which leads to this odd moment. All you do is pick up the phone. Anyone can do that. What are you doing? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. The next moment that I feel is worth mentioning is this piece where Yellow Guy talks about how if you are having trouble coping at work to call one of these three numbers. This reminds me of how difficult it is to find support at work and how many hoops you have to jump through just to get through to HR and have them actually do something about whatever issues you're having in the company. Whether it be harassment charges or workplace conditions contributing to mental health issues. Shortly after this we get another musical number that involves the duck trying to get support from the company with references to work-life balance at the literal forefront of the entire scene. Balancing working and having a fulfilling life is getting harder and harder, leading most to eventually fall and crumble underneath what's expected of them. Out of frustration of not being heard by the support system, Duck meets with the care hound, who looks exactly like the picture that we are shown. Not gonna lie, I know this part has some deeper meaning to it, but I couldn't help but laugh because it reminded me of those god-awful Peppa Pig memes that show her from the front, but anyways, Duck is seemingly killed and replaced with another version of himself. A version that is going to be more accepting of the workplace hierarchy and the status quo. 
Duck dying and being replaced will be a theme that is seen throughout the show. This moment, in fact, has led to a lot of theories on whether or not the duck that we see in the rest of the show is the original one that we started the show off with. And in the last episode specifically, it touches on why Duck gets replaced so often. After some more work banter and fitting in, Duck is told that there is a retirement party going on with the boss making a speech about the retiree. To his surprise, Red Guy and Yellow Guy have aged like 40 plus years, having worked at the same warehouse for their entire life. I took this scene as a representation of how some people will painstakingly work a low position job, making no money just because management dangles the idea of being promoted constantly. And then suddenly you're 65 years old and you end up in a situation like this. Remember how I mentioned earlier about this machine that has two functions to either grade an object as quality or faulty? Well, let's touch on that right after we watch this horrific incident. If you don't want to watch this scene due to the gruesome nature of it, I will give you guys a few seconds to find the next timestamp in the video. Just go ahead and scrub through the bar and I'll wait for you guys to do that. All right, you guys ready? Let's get into it. This isn't what we're supposed to be doing! Although I might be looking too deep into this, I thought Yellow Guy being ripped to shreds by the very piece of equipment that he operated for years was clearly a commentary on how people will quite literally work themselves to death doing the same menial job. And once they get to a certain age, they're deemed as faulty as Yellow Guy is. This is why his hand gets sucked in and spit out the same way that Duck's faulty part was just minutes ago in the episode. In the midst of the chaos, Duck grabs the first aid kit off the wall, which causes the song from earlier to continue, and just as you'd expect from Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, the characters are suddenly back to normal and healthy by the end of the episode. Some big thoughts to keep in mind as we move on to episode 2, Duck is not the same Duck that we see, or you know, he's at least a cloned version of the original. And we are also shown in the first episode that Duck is extremely self-aware of what's happening at all times around him and will serve as the almost common sense character throughout the series. Red Guy is a lot more vocal in the series than before, but still remains the good old deadpan individual that we love. And this will in fact come into play later. And Yellow Guy is still the same dopey, lovable individual at his core and seems to always just go with the flow. All of these characters will drastically change by the end of the show, but I have to watch and see exactly what that entails. Episode 2 Death. This episode deals with existentialism, life after death, and coping with the loss of loved ones, as well as the effect that it has on people's mental health. If you struggle with any of these topics, I highly suggest skipping over them, just because the themes in this episode can be a bit touchy. So if you feel as though it's too much for you, go ahead and skip over to episode 3. Let's start with the theme song change. This change is a lot more lighthearted than the other 5 episodes. In this episode, the lyric change and awkward moment comes during this section. I'm a talking pro-like thing. And I am red and made of string. And I'm a yellow pig. That's me. Not really much to say about that, so let's just get on with the episode. The plot revolves around Duck being announced dead via a eulogy in the newspaper. Red Guy is obviously confused at this as Duck is in front of him talking and clearly living. The teacher in this episode comes in the form of a coffin that is summoned after Duck's heart falls out of his chest. The coffin informs everyone that Duck is dead and then we burst into a song about getting things ready for the big day. I don't really have much to point out other than the fact that we get to see Red Guy's mouth for what I think is the first time ever and my god. Anyways, we are brought to the burial of Duck where everyone is in suits waiting for the inevitable to happen. There is a small jab at the embalming process here where the Duck explains how he had his insides removed, which can be a pretty invasive procedure. Now, I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but because it's Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, I'd give it the benefit of the doubt, but the entire episode feels like the viewer is being rushed into believing that the Duck is dead. 
and I think the pace is done on purpose with the intention of getting across what it's like for a close relative to die. It just kind of springs upon you, you know, one day your loved one is alive and the next they're just gone. Whether it be a family member or a close friend, it can always feel just out of nowhere when it happens and everything that is happening around you can feel very disingenuous. The way the funeral industry works, it feels like you haven't really gotten any time to digest what's happened or even mourn the death. And you're constantly thrown into paperwork, getting the funeral ready, and having to talk about your favorite memories with your loved one when you might not even be mentally there yet. This is why I think Red Guy struggles to talk in this moment. From the very beginning of the episode, he seems like he is struggling with the idea of his friend being gone and is in complete denial and tries to play it off like he truly doesn't care about it, even denying that the duck is his best friend at the funeral. Oh, well, I'm not the best friend. Yes, you are. I'm your best friend, I don't Yeah. Know. We're close. I mean, I know you. I know which one you are. Look, I'm leaving you all my stuff. Yeah, but I don't want it. I mean, that's just After the lackluster speech is given, a showcase displaying what is supposed to be Duck's favorite moment is played, accompanied by Yellow Guy saying what I think is the most important line in this entire thing. But he didn't farewell do any of that. I took that line as a reference to how sometimes a person that you know will pass away and you know that they are in fact a really, really bad person. But for some odd reason at their funeral, none of their true personality is shown. A facade is being upheld to respect this person's death and you know the best possible pictures are shown, the best possible memories are shown, but in the back of everyone's head, Everyone knows that they weren't even close to being like that in real life. They didn't do any of that. This is the complete opposite of what it was like to interact with that person when they were living. Again, I might be looking too deep into this, but that's just my interpretation of the scene. As Duck is being buried, it's clear that Yellow Guy is very much affected by the incident, but Red Guy seems almost oddly enough just unaffected by the entire ordeal. Once they get back home, the trio's dynamic is obviously off. The chair next to them is empty and reality begins to set in. Their friend is truly gone and they start realizing just how many pictures and things remind them of their friend, referring to how when a person passes, people will find any reason for literally anything to remind them of that person. The one thing I really liked about this scene was this part where Red Guy speaks up about the stuff that they hated about Duck, even biting Yellow Guy's leg. Oh come on, it's, it's not that bad. We didn't really like him anyway. Remember how he used to bite you? Yeah. A literal representation of someone leaving a lasting mark on you. The next scene also spoke to me. To get this next point across, I want you guys to imagine the person that you're most close with just randomly passing away. Maybe it's one member of your immediate family or a very, very close friend of yours. Just imagine that that person is no longer with you. Now picture yourself at the funeral and you start seeing people that you've literally never seen interact with your friend and they start coming up to you trying to act as though that person meant more to them than they did to you. It should piss you off and if it doesn't, you're a better person than I. I personally experienced this with a childhood friend of mine who passed recently and I remember interacting with some people who clearly didn't know this guy at all and people trying to act as though they did just really irritated me and that's what's happening in this scene it's a room full of what you think are strangers and we know this because yellow guy even flat out states why are these people acting like they care when they really didn't even know the deceased who are they we're just friends you didn't even know him who really did so let me know if you guys actually have experienced this i've personally went through this before but i feel like this happens at every single funeral that i've ever been to there's always people that pretend to care when in reality tomorrow is going to come and they're probably not even going to remember the person's funeral they went to now the next scene begins explaining life after death with this lamp telling us several explanations for what happens after we die and quickly shuts himself off and goes to bed the rest of the episode entails the two-thirds of the trio that's left trying to build a new friend to replace duck Right as Yellow Guy outright refuses to partake in such an activity, we are transitioned into what we think is going to be a musical number about accepting the death, but it's quickly interrupted by this character, Stain Edwards. 
a pink claymation humanoid creature that can take several types of shapes. Red Guy is quick to accept this new entity as a replacement for Duck, even rehashing the theme song to include Stain, which is met with negative response from Yellow Guy. This symbolizes one of the ways that people will try to cope with grieving. They may bring someone new into their life as a way of overcorrecting and replacing their loved one to fill the void that was left. While this is happening, we get this hilarious scene with Duck and the coffin where Duck basically refuses to die. Duck continuously annoys the coffin, asking them to play various games to entertain each other. To which the coffin replies that there isn't anything for Duck to do besides lay there and be dead. Right after this, we get to another scene with the pink claymation stain. He begins singing an optimistic song about how awesome it is to be alive. Just as it's getting into the rhythm, Yellow Guy shouts to stop it and ends the song abruptly. Red Guy and Yellow Guy then explain that Stain should just be quiet and stop questioning everything around them, basically telling them to sense the tone of the room. I took this scene to be a representation of a typical situation that can occur when faced with a traumatic family death. The pink claymation in this case representing a child that has never ever heard of the concept of death before. In the child's eyes, they don't really understand the severity of the situation, and in most cases, adults in their grieving state are almost way too emotional to give a sane and rational explanation, and would much rather lash out at the kid, which is what Red and Yellow Guy do in the situation. After this, we cut to the duck spending more time in the coffin. He annoys the coffin so much that it scolds Duck for being bad at being dead and encourages him to reflect upon his memories. Through a musical number about memories and grief, we see Red Guy trying to shape the claymation back into Duck, seemingly to replace him. And then we also see Yellow Guy digging up Duck from his grave. Yellow Guy brings Duck back home to a surprise, as we now see Red Guy has managed to successfully recreate a clone of the duck. Another ominous scene plays out, and then the theme song begins playing, but instead of them saying, there's three of us, it says, there's four of us. There's four of us, just four of us, there's here and you and me. and me. And this leads to a rather disturbing ending, where one of the ducks gets their head hit with a shovel and presumably perishes, with the duck that's wielding the shovel stating, four of us doesn't work. If it weren't obvious from the title's name and plot, I took this episode as a commentary on all things death. I think in general it tackled a lot of common situations around death, whether it be the impact it has on people grieving or the impact it has on our intrusive thoughts. I'm sure most of us can relate with the idea of staying up late at night looking up at the ceiling, reflecting on what really happens after death, and then proposing an amusing yet terrifyingly end to our life, which is living six feet under without anything to entertain us but our memories of when we were alive. Now as for actual plot, this episode doesn't really add much to the series besides the duck being replaced, but that is going to be an important piece of information for the later episodes. Episode 3. Family. Episode 3, if you hadn't guessed, is all about family. Throughout the episode, we see the struggle that most people go through, which is the eternal battle of the family you're born into and the family you find throughout life. The theme song change in this one is just this simple scene that I'm just going to play for you all because it's like five seconds and not much really happens. The one who is white tall. And I'm the one who's going bold. And I've gone bold as well. I believe this one tops the chart for the most lighthearted change of the theme song so far. This one starts off with Red and Yellow Guy watching this TV show titled Grolton and Havris with this specific episode of their TV show teasing the audience about what this Don't Hug Me I'm Scared episode will be about. Grolton angrily throws his plate out after realizing that his brother's visit to his house isn't until next month. After this, we are shown an advertisement for Grolton's new family discount for their chicken, which is rudely interrupted by Duck. The Duck turning off the TV at the mention of the word family might be an overarching theme for the episode as we will see later on in this one that he struggles with the concept of family. He then pulls out a bag of chuddle dollops to share with Red and Yellow Guy, but for some reason they can't figure out how to open it. 
This then leads to an apple appearing as this episode's teacher, only for it to be a red herring, as this child then grabs the apple, taking a bite out of it, and discarding it as trash. Introducing us to the real teachers of this episode. These two little twins with very, very creepy eyes. This is most likely done on purpose as this episode is heavily inspired by the horror genre. This is clear as later in the episode and even during the intro shot of these two, the music fades into more obscure, spooky background music. The kids propose an issue to the group, stating that the reason they can't open the bag of Chuddle Dollops is because they are not a family, insinuating that you have to be a family in order to open a family pack of anything. The group starts debating on whether or not Duck, Yellow, and Red Guy are in fact a family. This leads to Yellow Guy expressing his longing to see his dad, which will play a role later in the episode. The duck grows angry with the idea that no one believes they are a family, as he truly seems to enjoy what he thinks is his little family, made up of him, Yellow Guy, and Red Guy, even stating that he has tons of photos of them. Albeit, they aren't actually photos of them, but it's just a thought that counts, right? He chucks an insult at the children for being so obsessed with family, which causes this weird moment to happen, where the boy literally just pisses himself. There's no other way to put it besides that. He just literally pisses himself. Cue into another musical number sang by the twins about the theme of family. Also a side note, during the part where they sing B for bunk bed, they also piss themselves here as well. <laughs> just wanted to point that out in case you didn't see that. I feel like there's something here, but I'd honestly rather just laugh at it than analyze it. After this number, Red Guy expresses that he wants to be around people that look exactly like him, and Yellow Guy wants to meet people that also look like him. This prompts the twins to invite the group over to their house to see what a real family looks like. Before that happens though, we get a somewhat disheartening fact that the group doesn't really know much about each other. In fact, they are pretty much strangers that just happen to live together, as Red Guy even states clearly. We shouldn't really be talking to each other anymore, should we? We don't even know each other, really. We're just a bunch or a clump or something. Hey, don't say that. Of course we know each other. Look. No, wait, that's... The group then follows the twins they just met to their house, and this is where the horror vibes really start to show. Throughout the rest of the episode, they go through tons of family tropes, and with each one, we get these nice little title cards. There are five in total, with each one displaying a phrase or activity that families should do together. A family should treasure their memories, play games together, respect their elders, keep records, and eat together. The last 13 minutes of this episode are divided into these five family roles, and each one gets increasingly more obscure and scary. On the first one, a family should treasure their memories. We see the twins, Lily and Todney, put on their home videos as we are introduced to the rest of their family, their grandmother, their brother, and their father. Yes, the father is the baby looking one. You will see throughout the episode that everyone takes a weird liking towards Yellow Guy, and it's hinted at why in this scene. When they mention the mother, the brother groans as if it's a sensitive topic, and it does end up being one as we see later on in the episode. The rest of the scene is nothing special, we just get a glimpse into their life with father and grandmother watching them on a picnic. Duck grows increasingly impatient, wanting to go back home already, but it's quickly interrupted by their grandmother, who all of a sudden now wants to play some games. I'm going to note here that the grandmother is always the one moving the family along to the next activity. In each part, we see the grandma ring her bell, which makes the family aware that they should be getting a move on to the next fun thing to do. I feel like this is a play on the idea of respecting your elders. Maybe it's because I come from a massive and huge Hispanic family, but I distinctly remember growing up that we would just blindly believe and do whatever our elders said without question which is obviously a very toxic belief to uphold. In each scene, she rings the bell like a child throwing a temper tantrum. She can't handle doing any activity for longer than she wants to, which I think might be a jab at the older generation and how they claim that younger generations are super sensitive, but are quite literally oversensitive themselves when it comes to politics and change in general. Obviously not everyone fits into these blanket statements, but that's just what I felt this little detail added to the overall meaning of this episode. The next title card then flashes, stating, A family should play. 
as we cut to the group playing a dark looking board game. Todney lands on a space that allows him to read a family secret, and when questioned about why he's not reading it out loud, the twins respond that it's supposed to be a secret, and that every family should have secrets. I like to believe that this is a classic play on how everyone has skeletons in their closet. I'm sure most of us can relate to the idea or experience where a family argument breaks out, and suddenly everyone is bringing up secrets from like, 10 plus years ago that you didn't even know about. And this part sheds some light on how some families will go years with these deep dark secrets, believing that having said secrets is for the betterment of their family when in actuality it definitely is not. The rest of the game plays out and then they let Yellow Guy play with their mother's piece. The duck gets angry, stating how it must be time for them to go home, but the twins relent that they must finish the game first. So the duck grabs the mother's piece from Yellow Guy, which sparks a huge frenzy. The twins then exclaim that only mother is allowed to grab the piece, so they end up kicking duck out, leaving him back at home. Another title card displays, reading, a family should respect their elders. It's here that we are introduced to the family tree. And here we get some more horror movie vibes as we see each picture has a bunch of black X's over the top. And then we get this really funny comedic moment with the red guy. Well, hang on a minute. If, if I'm not mistaken, these pictures, they've all, they've been, they've all been framed. Um, yes. Nice, framed pictures. The twins are more creepy towards Yellow Guy during this part, showing favoritism towards him, and then we see this very, very disturbing medical blood draw scene. The red guy wants to find his family members, so the family tree decides it will draw some blood from him in order to find those family members. It ends up taking too much blood from him and leaves red guy fainting from what I can gather. Not really sure as the scene ends up diving into this weird AI art type of imagery. Then we cut to the duck asking a family of bread if they need any more family members, leading to this disturbing scene where he takes the youngest child of the bread and toasts it alive. Now, now, come along now, children. Let's go home for daddy's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, please go. You know what? I'm not gonna lie, this part actually freaked me out a little bit because of the voice acting, but besides the point, this entire scene and the musical number that follows expresses the duck struggle of not having a family to go to, claiming that he doesn't need a family, but depressingly, he only has himself as his family, clearly showing that he does in fact want one, but is in denial about the fact that most of his close relatives are either gone or just don't want anything to do with him. This leads to our second to last title card, a family should keep records. We're then shown the twins measuring their height by marking with a sharpie on the wall how tall they are, which is an absolute real thing that everyone does in childhood. I'm sure everyone has one of these walls in their room or somewhere in their house. I actually have mine like right back there. Actually, I probably show some footage of it on the screen. But, you know, it's a little throwback to those times where you'd wake up and measure your height in the hopes that you've gained an inch or two. Now, back to the episode, they actually mark Yellow Guy's height in a rather unsettling manner, telling each other in a dark undertone that Yellow Guy is almost part of the family. If it wasn't crystal clear already, it's constantly alluded to that they're gonna do some very, you know, weird or super creepy thing to Yellow Guy. We've all seen horror movies and we know how weird Don't Hug Me I'm Scared can be. So at this point in the episode, I was fully expecting them to like dismember him or like have Yellow Guy tied up somewhere, but that's not even close to what ends up happening. The grandma rings her bell indicating that it's bedtime. They do touch on something here that I find hilarious. As adults, we kind of just sleep whenever we want, but I'm sure we can all relate to being a child and being told that it's time for bed at some arbitrarily early time. This is indicated by Yellow Guy noting that it's so bright outside, wondering why they're going to bed at a time like this. To put him to sleep, Todney sings in his very nasty voice a bedtime song which somehow puts Yellow Guy to sleep. Finally, we see Red Guy posing with a bunch of other similar looking people. The one thing that I wanted to point out during this scene is how Red Guy sticks out like a sore thumb. Not only is he not standing in the correct spot, 
but he's not even wearing any clothes like everyone else is. This might be looking too deep into it as I've stated before, but I took this as a metaphor on how some people feel like the black sheep of their family. That one family member that for some reason doesn't understand how to operate themselves in their current family setting. No matter what this person does, even when they are just being their true selves, they are somehow made out to be the bad guy. For instance, in this scene, Red Guy claims that the reason he is so jittery is because he's just happy to have a family, to which the camera guy says, you're ruining it. And you on the left, can you stop smiling? Oh, am, am I smiling? Yes. I'm sorry, I just can't help myself. I'm just happy to finally be with my family. Yeah, you're ruining it. We can't have him in the shot. What? No, please, come on. Some people might be able to relate to this, and maybe some of my viewers out there are middle children if you happen to have that type of dynamic in your family. The scene then ends with the picture being taken and Red Guy falling back into his normal house. We then see the last title card that states, A Family Should Eat Together. And it's here that we finally see why the family's been acting so weird around Yellow Guy. It's implied that their mother is gone from the family and they wanted Yellow Guy to replace her. This is why he got the mother's piece in the board game and why they dressed him up as her. And the reason they wanted him as a replacement was, and I'm not kidding, to qualify for the family discount at the chicken place we saw at the beginning of the episode. They start chancing for him to make the call and then it's revealed that this guy is the father when the kid hypes them up calling them dad to yellow guy's surprise. Then we see the family disgustingly dig into their food and it's at this point that we finally see Yellow Guy's wish come to fruition, which is to see his dad. Roy makes his grand entrance only to push Yellow Guy out of the room and seemingly eat the rest of the family members off screen. The episode then ends with everyone back at the table where it started, ending with Yellow Guy sharing the theme of the episode, which is that a family is just a group that cares for each other and sticks together. This revelation allows them to finally open the bag of Chuddle Dollops, which only has two pieces in it, leading to another argument over who gets them. Overall, I feel the message of this episode was obvious, but one thing I wanted to note was my interpretation of the beginning and the end. We start off the episode with the arbitrary goal of opening this family-sized pack of Chuddle Dollops. And it's this small problem that ends up leading to much more revelations happening throughout the episode. Yellow Guy realizes that he wants to see his dad, the duck wants to be left alone, and the red guy just wants a family of his own. And what's funny is that each one gets exactly what they want. The duck is left alone to his own thoughts, which only depresses him. Red Guy gets the family he's been dreaming of, only to be seen as the black sheep. And Yellow Guy finally sees his dad, but it's not at all what he expected. Leading us back to the small Chuddle Dollops bag that started this. I feel this could be interpreted as a huge analogy for how dysfunctional families will take the smallest issue, blow it way out of proportion, only for us to get led back to the original problem and realize just how silly the entire argument was. I also feel like the fact that everyone got exactly what they wanted only for it to not be what they expected might be a play on the idea of the grass is greener on the other side. It's not always true. You know, when you get exactly what you want, it might not be what you expected. And every single character gets exactly what they want in this episode, but it doesn't turn out the way that they thought it would. And I feel like, you know, that's ex exactly how life will go sometimes. You might find yourself in a situation that you're stuck in and you want out, but when you finally do get out, it's not at all what you thought it was going to be. That's just my interpretation of the events in this episode, and I'm happy to hear what everyone else's thoughts on this episode was. Episode 4, Friendship. The weird part of this episode's theme song was this small chunk where Red Guy screams at the viewers. When you're learning with us guys, we live in an actual nightmare. This episode is based all around friendship, but for those that have actually watched the episode, you might feel as though this is incorrect. The episode is widely disliked due to this one character in it called Warren the Eagle, or also known as Warren the Worm. 
to really put into perspective how this episode is about friendship, you should view this character as that one guy in the friend group that makes everything about themselves and creates their own problems, hoping to score some sympathy points and never taking any accountability for their actions. All around, these types of people are just insufferable, mostly because they try to come off as nice people that aren't trying to be manipulative, even though they very much are. So as we go through this episode, keep this in mind. The episode starts with the characters wanting to use their computer on what's called computer day. They run into a huge problem though when they cannot remember their password, leading to one of the funniest representations of the Kapschka being impossible meme. The issue for this episode stems from the group believing that yellow guy is supposed to know the password and when he can't, they get mad at him because now they can't use the computer. They begin to insult yellow guy for forgetting the password and in doing so we are then introduced to Warren the Worm for the first time, who will keep pausing the show with this OK Stop logo with the intention of teaching the viewer on how to be a good friend. However, we learn that Warren used to be affiliated with a friendship nurture group called OK Stop, but he was let go or fired for some odd reason. We know this because Warren explains, Now I should make it clear from the outset that although I am no longer officially affiliated with the OK Stop organization, I am still absolutely within my rights to continue to use their learning materials and branding, okay? So right from the get-go, we already know that Warren is not really the most reliable character. At first, it appears as though Warren is actually trying to be the good guy, defending Yellow Guy after being insulted for a really small common issue. Red Guy and Duck don't like this, and then they say, Friends Hold on, that are you saying we're the bad friends? It's him who couldn't remember the password. Oh really? This dispute forces Warren into a musical number about how to not be a bad friend but not before he depressingly asked the group if they might want to go get a restaurant style meal with him, clearly showing a need for friendship on Warren's part. Then he began singing his song. The entire song is about Warren's backstory from his point of view. He explains he had a lot of friends before, friends he would stay up late with and talk on the phone, but when he approached them with an amazing business opportunity, they didn't bother listening to him, leading to him being angry at his friends, so one day he tells them that they aren't being good friends, causing them to apologize, but it was too late, or so Warren says. What's amazing about this musical number is if you go back and look at all these slides, it actually tells a vastly different story than the one that Warren laid out for us. It starts out normal with him having friends and talking on the phone, but then it gets weird when he states that he would stay up late and laugh together. In this slide, you can see his friend is fast asleep with Warren's eyes looking dead shot and no other friends are in the room. There's just what appears to be the friend's dog on the ground next to them. I'm fairly certain that this implies that Warren snuck into his friend's house to watch him sleep, which is pretty weird if that's what I'm actually seeing here. Then the next slide is the one explaining his small depression phase. But it wasn't really a depression, Warren is just upset that he's not the center of attention for one period of his life. Instead, this cute little bunny has a spotlight, which he can't handle. Warren then explains the business idea to his friends, which they disliked, telling him that the idea was not a great one. This is a normal thing that I feel actual friendships endure. If you're a good friend, you'll give an honest opinion. And if you see your friend doing something that you think is a terrible financial decision, you'd most likely step in and give your real opinion on the matter. For example, I can't tell you guys how many times I've had friends approach me with what appears to be an MLM scheme without them knowing what that is, and I'd have to explain to them what exactly is happening and why they should get out. That's being a good friend, not giving in to your friends' interests and ideas just because you're friends. Real friends are not yes men. Real friends tell you guys how it is. This next part also shows how Warren rewrites history in his head, which I think is a normal thing for people that suffer from his way of thinking. He shows this slide with writing all over it that says, bad friends, even though you can clearly see one of them happily smiling around everyone. This is furthered on the next slide when you see his friends crying and apologizing to Warren, which clearly isn't the case as he just drew all over these even drawing the thought bubble that says we're so sorry. The reason I wanted to touch on this part so thoroughly is because I've dealt with these types of people in my life. I've been friends with people who take everything personally and rewrite events in their head to reaffirm and validate their own twisted feelings. 
everyone is completely entitled to their own emotions and way of thinking but when you start bad mouthing people and painting events in a manner that did not happen that's where i draw the line and that's what warren does i'm sure most of you have experienced people like this in your life and i believe this episode is meant to touch on those types of people which is why Warren plays such a major role in the episode. After the musical number ends, Warren then explains that the story was about him, if that wasn't already obvious, which leads to another okay stop moment. And yada yada yada, you know, nothing really happens. What's important is that in this conversation happening, Red Guy brings up Warren's appearance, which clearly irks him, causing a mental breakdown where he begrudgingly tries to convince everyone that he has enough confidence, even though he clearly does not have enough confidence. This is rudely interrupted by the yellow guy shouting the password for the computer, prompting the group to finally get on the internet and completely disregard whatever they were doing. I can interpret this moment a few different ways. It could represent how quick we are to disregard people that are clearly going through you know, some kind of trauma in their life. Warren representing a friend in need of help and the group being friends that you know just brush off their pleas for help. You could also interpret the quick switch to the online section as a nod at how being online seems to quite literally suck you in. You know, with these websites, you know, even the one that you're watching this on, they're manufactured to keep your attention span watching and just have you happily looking at everything without so much as a thought in your head. The trio decides to check their emails, but when Yellow Guy doesn't have any, he becomes quite depressed. Warren does another OK Stop segment, explaining that this is what happens when you don't respect each other. Then he announces that he is leaving, but Red Guy stops him by stating what's happened to their friend. We then get a glimpse of what exactly is happening with Yellow Guy, and we see that he's having a blast inside of his head with his new brain friends. Just as the worm begins leaving, Red Guy entices him to help them with Yellow Guy by saying that they will go to a restaurant with him if Warren is able to fix Yellow Guy. Warren decides to go into Yellow Guy's brain in an attempt to snap him out of his sadness, but he is pleasantly surprised when Yellow Guy's brain friends are extremely nice to him, causing Warren to not want to leave as he's enjoying his time being there, possibly being the only time where Warren's presence is actually wanted. This does not last long though, as Warren is adamant about putting on his own music instead of the music that they've been playing. Warren then jumps into another OK Stop segment that being a good friend is about respecting what everyone wants to do. This, this is completely ironic as he is directly going against what everyone else in the room wants to do, which is to listen to Yumper Dingle's music and not whatever he's trying to put on. The worm is unable to put on his podcast, which basically ruins everyone's fun. We then jump to the guys that are trying to figure out what's wrong with Yellow Guy by going onto a WebMD type of website. Cut back to the brain friends who have all left the room because of Warren, with one of the characters unaliving themselves. Warren then disregards all of Yellow Guy's needs because Warren really wants to have a restaurant style meal with literally anyone. In this case, he's ordering food for him and Yellow Guy. Again, relating back to what I was saying about those types of insufferable people that put their needs above everyone else's no matter the situation believing themselves to be the only important person at all times. Warren's actions caused an inception of sadness to happen inside of Yellow Guy. As Yellow Guy is already depressed in real life, but he's now sad inside of his brain, showing Yellow Guy drift into an other deeper layer of the brain friends. We then see the red guy and duck trying to diagnose Yellow Guy, and I'm just gonna play this scene out because it's kind of hard to summarize these next 30 seconds. Okay, this is my, my, my final question. Right, there's your friend of a worm in his brain. A worm in his brain? How are we supposed to know that? Yeah, a worm in his brain. How would that even work? That's... Oh no, he does have that. Remember? From earlier. There's a worm in his brain, he does, yeah. Okay, great. I'm ready to diagnose. Just processing my diagnosis. My diagnosis is... Your friend has got a worm in his brain. Oh, no! I took this part as a reference to how people will have the obvious answer to the problem right in front of them, but they will only believe it when someone on the internet reaffirms that belief. 
It could also be a reference to the hilarious self-diagnosis that takes place every day when people look up their own symptoms. You know, that usually goes one of two ways. Either you're told, you know, you're basically dying right now or you're told exactly what you've looked up. What happens next further enforces the intrusive nature of friends like Warren. He goes deeper into Yellow Guy's brain, forcing Yellow Guy to go even deeper to try and escape the likes of the worm, causing his face to grow even longer with depression as his friends attempt to remedy the issue. Warren ends up turning into whatever the hell this thing is, and all is returned to normal. The episode then ends with the computer giving them another computer to use every day, and Yellow Guy opens up about how he thought everyone hated him for being stupid. Red Guy then responds that that's silly, and that it's just the worm in his brain telling him thoughts like that. They then begin singing about the worm in your brain, and that this worm in your brain is what causes your personal insecurities. Then we see one of Yellow Guy's brain friends appear in the room with him, which freaks him out, and in the process he breaks the computer that they just got as a gift. This makes Duck mad, which causes this hilarious fight between them, where they start breaking bottles on each other, and just, yeah. So my final thoughts on this episode have been pretty much said throughout the analysis. I really do believe the point of Warren the Worm was for the sake of including a representation of those unbearable people out there who create their own drama and then get upset when people become annoyed with their fabricated issues. I also wanted to point out that the ending did a fantastic job of explaining how personal insecurities are created. Most people create their own insecurities based on the reaction or perceived reaction of others. For example, Yellow Guy became depressed when he had no emails. For whatever reason, he thought him having no emails from his friends meant that they thought he was stupid, pushing him into this deep hole of dark thoughts. When in reality, if you watch that scene, they never really said anything like that. In fact, Duck is actually having a pretty uplifting reaction to Yellow Guy having no emails. Nothing in the inbox, eh? <laughs> well, there's always next year. Anyway, let's get on to the dark web and have a look at some of them. I think the idea of people having a worm in their head is a great metaphor on how people will allow that little voice in their head to dictate their entire mood. When everything could be solved if you just talked your issues out like a rational person. Episode 5. Transport. Episode 5's theme has a reference to episode 4, or possibly a reference to a later scene in episode 6. I'm not really sure which one to discern, but I'm going to go with the episode 4 route right now because we just went over episode 4. So, Yellow Guy recounts his experience with his brain friends as the tone of the scene becomes increasingly darker, with his voice becoming more echoey and the scene literally turning dark and bland, then it's back to normal. Here's that scene for you guys to digest and see what I mean by it relating back to episode 4. I'm the one who had a dream where there was stuff like there was another me and everything was lots of fun and I went and saw the other some people also think that this could relate to episode 6 with the details that he's saying also lining up with stuff that happens in the last episode of the series. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Before I start really getting into this episode, I wanted to preface this part by saying that episode five and six are super plot heavy, meaning the events of each episode are integral to the overall plot and world of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. I will be touching on the overall plot towards the end of this video, but as I said in the beginning, this is my analysis and interpretation of the deeper meanings of the episode. So I won't be mentioning too much about the effects of the events that take place in each episode, but I'll more so be uh, interpreting it and explaining how it relates to our lives. After all, this is the painful accuracy of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. It's not really a 
you know analysis of what's going on in the show it's more an analysis of what we're supposed to take away from the show personally episode five is all about transportation and all about those times when you decide to leave your home and go on an adventure this episode begins as usual with red guy getting mad at duck for his antics and yellow guy being himself it becomes apparent that red guy has grown tired of living with duck and yellow guy stating multiple times that he just doesn't want to be home. I feel like many of us can relate to this now, especially with every person in the world experiencing the effect of being isolated at home due to the COVID lockdown. We all eventually got to that point where we would walk around our house for hours and just long for something more. You're tired of seeing the same faces, the same rooms, and the same decor every single day. This might cause you to lash out at your family and you might even want to take matters into your own hands, which is what Red Guy ends up doing later in this episode. Red Guy's frustrations summon this old train character that ends up taking the group on their journey slash teaching moment. The train is super old, old enough that it can't even hear anymore. I thought this to be a very obvious reference to people's concerns on the oil industry and the controversial issues surrounding oil consumption falling on deaf ears. The train tries its best to power through the musical number that it has planned for today, but it ends up going dead. The car going dead in this manner only furthered my belief in my interpretation as before it goes completely dead, it morphs into this horrific monster which I thought was a jab at how vehicles are inherently evil because of what they can do to our environment. But because transportation is so ingrained in today's society, it's nearly impossible to stop the problem as most of the world relies on this transportation to keep today's infrastructures from collapsing. The car dying forces Red Guy to take matters into his own hands, deciding to turn the car on himself and begin driving with no destination in mind just the longing for some kind of community. Relating back to the idea I stated earlier about how people can grow quite irritable with their current living situation, wishing to move out into a community that they can call their own. During the drive, we meet this GPS, which touches on a very important detail of the show, which is what happened to the original plot of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. We all remember the original Wakey Wakey teaser trailer that came out a long time ago, and with it introduced us to Clay Hill, a fictional city in the world of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. This GPS makes mention of Clay Hill, stating that the entire city doesn't exist and that it's simply shriveled up. Stick around to the end as I will touch on basically why the original plot was abandoned. Or if you guys want to skip to that now, you can go ahead and do that. Red Guy becomes fed up with the GPS and opts to just throw it out the window. Duck and Yellow Guy become increasingly impatient as well, wishing that they were back home. And it's at this point that we touch on one of my favorite parts of this episode. We get this segment, which I think is a clear critique on inequality when it comes to transport of any kind. Duck gets some nice comfy headphones and is able to relax and watch one of his favorite shows while Yellow Guy is stuck with no entertainment and instead has objects that ruin his transportation experience. In a real life sense, some people might have the more luxurious car, they can afford first class or help. They might even have a private jet to take them anywhere, while others have to settle for the more affordable option, which is less than desirable. After this segment, we get a strange introduction into the town known as Molhoven. We see Yellow Guy gets brought into this community with his pet that looks like Duck and his neighbor that looks clearly like Red Guy. Yellow Guy is then offered a gift, which is presumably a pet bird that ends up flying off into the sky, causing Yellow Guy to run after it into the street, getting hit by a car in the process. I will touch on this a bit later, as this entire scene is extremely important to the overall plot of the show, but as I said, I'll go into much more detail about that towards the end of this video. Yellow Guy snaps out of his trance and the car ride takes a turn for the worst. Everything stops working, including the show that the duck was watching. Duck cries out that now he will never know what happens in the story, and then Red Guy drops this knowledge bomb on him. Now I'll we'll never know if Grolton made his appointment. Well, obviously he will. He always does. What do you mean? Grolton always makes his appointment and no matter what happens, they start the next episode back at home. No, well, don't spoil it. I'm not spoiling it. Very self-aware, as it's clearly a reference to how at the beginning of each Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared iteration, the group is there, healthy and untouched, regardless of how crazy each episode gets. It's at this point that the car becomes alive again, and Red Guy freaks out because he so desperately wants to get out of his living situation, exclaiming that they're so close and that they can't go back home. Finally, the world begins glitching, and suddenly, they are in the real world. As they start to explore the surroundings around them, 
the episode nears its end. Yellow Guy questions what's going on as the trio finds themselves comfortable around a campfire, with Duck ticking off more things from his list. Then in a sick plot twist, we get this shot where we see a hand bringing the car from the episode back to the trio's house, explaining that their journey always ends up with them back at home. All in all, I think episode 5 was mostly used to set up for the wonderful finale that is episode 6. The main point that I feel like is important to note before going on to episode 6 is the fact that Yellow Guy is emphasized as being integral to the overall story and meaning, as well as introducing this new character that is somehow playing God with our characters. Episode 6, Electricity. So I feel like the entirety of this episode in actuality is still a commentary style episode, but it's not really what you might expect it to be on. Because what's being critiqued isn't some crazy thing about society. What's actually being critiqued is us, the viewer. To understand this, I feel it's imperative to explain why the series made its debut in the first place. The first iteration of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared was created because Baker Terry, Becky Sloan, and Joe Pelling had just come out of art school and they believed the idea of teaching creativity was hilarious. And so they wanted to make fun of the notion that you could teach creativity. Because if you can teach creativity, it inherently creates this idea that there is a wrong or right way to teach it. And this reflects in the first iteration of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. The YouTube video masquerades as a typical children's show because that's where creativity is usually taught in kids. And it's insane to think that kids are taught, quote unquote, correct ways to think creatively. And by the way, none of this is coming from me. This is actually directly taken from an interview where Becky Sloan flat out explains that they wanted to slightly take the piss out of that type of thinking. So how does this all relate to episode six? Well, episode six uses tons of metaphors and symbolism to explain how what was once a very simple series has now basically been taken over by the fandom. And although the creators welcome this and honestly enjoy the back and forth relationship with their fan base, it also kind of irritates them a little bit that people are missing the point behind the show and their series. In fact, this is why I structured the video the way that I did. Everyone is basically doing videos on the theories and lore behind the show, but I don't really like Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared for that reason. I actually enjoy the series because of its critique on very everyday topics, such as working yourself to death in a warehouse, existential dread, undying devotion to family, toxic friendships, and feeling stuck in life. Every episode has something to do with things that you and I will deal with at some point in our lives. And nowadays, people don't even really talk about that aspect of the series anymore, and we get fixated on these rather arbitrary details. I'm kind of just, you know, rambling my thoughts right now, but believe me, we will touch on this throughout the episode. The intro and theme song on episode 6 is drastically different from the other five episodes of the series. In fact, the entire thing is just completely absent. Instead, we get this eerie shot of the house being slowly cranked by this mysterious figure, and there's no door opening sequence. We just cut straight to the trio in the kitchen as normal. So from the very get-go, we already know this episode is not going to be your typical episode of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Duck is seen doing a crossword puzzle and is having trouble finishing it. When Yellow Guy offers some help, the other two berate him over his nonsensical suggestion, and then he mistakenly throws some clean plates away, which gets him berated once more. This scene is just used to overemphasize how clueless Yellow Guy is because of what happens later in the episode. I don't really think there's any symbolism or significance to this part besides that. We finally get to our teacher of the episode, which ends up being this electrical box, which is named Electracy. I'm just gonna call them Tracy throughout the episode because that's a lot easier, but they're a female electrical box that breaks into a musical number about how electricity powers everything, from your house lights, to your printer, and even the device that you're watching the show on. The disturbing part of this musical number is when the teacher cuts this pet hamster in half to show that it doesn't really have any electricity inside. This part's actually extremely gruesome for Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared standards, so I'm probably not gonna show it on screen. And there's also this part afterwards where Yellow Guy gets put into an electric chair. Then we get this very odd emphasis on the duck's personal shredder, which is swiftly cut off for the awesome guitar riff sequence. Finally, the group asks a very interesting question, which is, 
how exactly is the robot running off electricity if it's not plugged in? It explains that it's using batteries, which Yellow Guy then reveals he also is powered by batteries. Duck takes it upon himself to switch the batteries, which fills Yellow Guy with real logical thoughts for the first time and makes our teacher dumb as bolts. Pun intended. For me, this scene represents what has happened to the series since its debut all that time ago. Becky, Joe, and Baker are all represented by the teacher, Tracy. They are the teacher because that's what they've always been. They've slowly been introducing us, the viewer, to more topics that they feel need more attention. And each video in the original series reflects that. The trio represents us, the viewer, with the duck completely ignoring everything that the teacher has said and taking it upon himself to just switch the batteries, effectively switching the power from the creator to the fandom. I was led to this interpretation because of the shredder part. In this entire sequence, we are talking about what I feel like are very important things when it comes to electricity, but rather than soak all the information in, the duck picks an arbitrary object to shift his focus to, which is his amazing shredder. Much like how when the original series debuted, people would lock onto these arbitrary details such as the date June 19th instead of actually soaking in the lesson of the video. Effectively leaving the creator quite literally powerless because of the fan base's reaction to whatever decision that they make. Obviously this is a little bit too literal, but there's definitely pressure to please the crowds now that the series is extremely popular. This is shown in how detailed the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared team is with their show leaving easter eggs upon easter eggs for those viewers that love inspecting every single frame of everything that comes out from them. They've even said themselves in that same interview that I explained earlier that they do in fact enjoy doing this because it's fun. Of course I could be looking a little bit too deep into this but that's just what I've taken away from this. This is all my interpretation. You don't have to agree with it. In fact, I'm open to hearing everyone else's interpretation of the series. Maybe I'm the one taking it too, too far for no reason. And I should just be looking at lore and stuff. But I like to think that the creators have put more meaning into this than, you know, they've let on. I don't, I don't want to believe that it's just face value because of how the original series was made. Now, besides that, we get Yellow Guy as our guide into the rest of the episode with his newfound knowledge. He begins teaching Duck and Red Guy about topics instead of doing what's believed to be normal and waiting for someone to come and teach them. This is actually very important because it explains that the characters are very self-aware that every day they expect some random being to come teach them something new. Duck even has a mental breakdown stating that he doesn't understand what's happening and that Yellow Guy isn't supposed to be acting that way. Yellow Guy takes this as his cue to leave the group and proceeds to go upstairs and finds himself at the big boy's room. In here we see a more aged and wise version of the Red Guy and Duck and they explain that they are the big boys and instead of learning about one subject at a time, they learn about two at the same time. Q, two teachers having a musical number. Yellow Guy seems to want something else besides more general knowledge. He seems to want some kind of answer as to what's going on. And in doing so, he leaves the big boy's room, heading upstairs once more. Cut back to Red Guy and Duck, where they basically have trashed the entire kitchen with electronics that they did not understand. Again, touching on the idea that things have gotten out of hand with Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, now that the fandom is more in control than our poor creators. They begin using so much electricity that it shorts out their house right as we cut to the yellow guy moving to the bigger boy's room. The room is bright white and futuristic with red guy and duck appearing way more technologically involved. They explain that they are doing an experiment on whatever the hell this thing is. Now because each room or each level has to have some kind of teacher in it, I can only assume that this was some kind of teacher for the group that they somehow captured and began doing experiments on. The characters even state flat out that they just began doing experiments on whatever this being is. Kind of like how the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared series came out and was left to be dissected by the onslaught of creators like me who have nothing better to do than analyze the absolute hell out of this series leaving us with this, a mess that's completely unrecognizable from what the original intent was. Yellow Guy wants him to stop experimenting, leaving the bigger boy's room, to another room titled Leslie. In here, there is this person playing a piano with a diorama of the house with figurines of each character in the series. 
Yellow Guy asks who this mysterious figure is, and she gives him her name, Leslie, while commenting that Yellow Guy is one of her favorites. Yellow Guy begins asking her questions that most of the fan base has asked over the years. What is the answer? Why do all of this? Why even create the series to begin with? To which Leslie simply laughs and carries on, and when questioned further, she has this response. What's going on? Why are you laughing? Because it's so funny! Gosh. You still can't see the funny side. The two agree to help each other out and we cut to Duck and Red Guy walking around in a pitch black room. It's here that we get to see a few familiar faces such as the meat and the clock from the original series and even a small shot of Roy ending with this toilet being revealed. We then see Yellow Guy accidentally break this toy figurine of Duck which she then says is okay as she's got tons of backups opening a drawer full of ducks to replace the one that broke. In exchange for helping Leslie, Yellow Guy is given this book, which presumably contains all the answers to everyone's questions about the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared world. Yellow Guy doesn't even understand what's happening, saying the following. You wanted this, didn't you? Uh, did I? <laughs> you are just too funny. This feels like how people don't even understand what they want from the series. They are constantly packing each episode with details and details that may go unnoticed, leaving the creator, which in this case is Leslie, to say, this is what you wanted, isn't it? And Yellow Guy, which is the viewer, being confused because they don't know what they're looking for. You know, we don't know what we're, we don't know the answer that we want. We just know that something weird is going on behind the scenes. You know, we just want to be told what to look at. Leslie then ends the conversation in a very strange manner. When Yellow Guy asks if he can stay with her, Leslie exclaims, you're not my real son, to which Yellow Guy leaves with his book. Yellow Guy is then manhandled by Duck, who replaces the batteries with the electrical box batteries. Yellow Guy ends up being dumbed down once again, and in being dumbed down, he ends up shredding the book that the viewers would kill for. I took this sequence as a middle finger to the audience, basically saying, you know, you thought it would be that easy, didn't you? And the character is quite literally mocking us for thinking as such. And the series then ends with this cliffhanger. And that's pretty much it for the entire series. Now, aside from the analytical points that I've discussed so far, there's one big elephant in the room that I have yet to touch on, which is the actual face value plot to the show. In my opinion, based on what I've seen so far, I think it's clear that Leslie is the originator of the entire Don't Hug Me I'm Scared world that we are seeing. And it's theorized, or at the very least hinted at, that she has endured some kind of loss. Most believe that Leslie has lost her son and that she's recreated her son to be represented by Yellow Guy. The basic reasoning for this is because of the fact that there is this scene in episode 5 where we see Yellow Guy get run over. It's entirely possible that while playing with the dolls, Leslie got sentimental and began thinking about the tragedy that took the son that she once loved, causing her to have this insane outburst and, you know, freaking Yellow Guy out. And the entirety of the show might be Leslie coping with the fact that her son is gone by teaching her made-up son, which is Yellow Guy and her friends, these basic life topics that her son will never get to learn as he passed away a long time ago. In short, it's just her way of coping with the loss. Of course, there are tons of other theories as to what is going on, and if you wish to take a look at those, I'll leave a link at some of my favorite videos on the topic thus far, but this is the story that I choose to believe based on the information that we have been given. Now, the other big elephant in the room that needs to be addressed is why the original plot was abandoned. I think to understand season 1, it's extremely important that we explain why the original plot with the town of Clayhill was abandoned. I mean, you know, it's even mentioned in the show that the original plot will not come into play as the town doesn't even exist anymore. Coming directly from the source herself, Becky Sloan said in an interview that the town and neighbors plot was a bit South Park and even went on to explain how the timelessness of the original series was absent from the old TV show plot. This also explains why the show took so long to come out, because they had to have abandoned the entire plot in favor of writing an entirely new show, so I can see why it took nearly three years for the show to be made. I personally think it was a good call to change up the plot because 
Although Wakey Wakey did do a great job of getting us hyped up for the first season of Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, I'm not so sure if it would have captured the essence of what made Don't Hug Me I'm Scared special. I think what we got instead stays very true to the original series and it expands on the original characters. This is something that a lot of spin-off shows from YouTube series get wrong. When you take a short like Don't Hug Me I'm Scared and apply it to a longer format, having a, a 30 minute show now instead of just like a six minute sequence, you have to make some changes. You can't just make a 30 minute song, you know? So what we have now is the same style musical numbers from the original series seamlessly spliced in between these comedic, disturbing, and character-driven moments. If you've seen season one, which, I mean, if you're watching this video, I hope you have, season one has done a fantastic job of not only staying true to the themes of the original Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared series, but I really do believe that they've successfully expanded on the world and it's become something better than what we could have ever imagined. Let me know if you guys liked this analysis or my take on the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared series. I'm definitely going to be doing more of these in the future. This video took a long time to come out just because it's, you know, very thorough explanation of my thoughts on the series and I really enjoyed the TV show. I think even if you don't want to take away any of the deeper meanings or whatnot, I think this show is actually a really good watch if you want to throw it on for like, you know, f like a family or whatnot. I think it's actually pretty good. Aside from the very like disturbing, you know, parts of it, I still think it's not that bad of a show to watch, even if you're not into the lore or into the deeper meanings behind it. It's pretty funny at times, and I feel like you can definitely relate to some of the characters, even if you don't want to get into it like the fandom has. So let me know your thoughts below, and be sure to check out my Patreon. It's getting a lot harder to stay monetized nowadays. Uh, right now, I have around five behind-the-scenes videos on some of my most popular videos. So if you want to go see some little Easter eggs or just a general behind-the-scenes look at all the research that goes into those videos, go check that out over on Patreon. Speaking of Patreon, it's time for the patron shout-out. Again, I say this in every single video since I released the Patreon, but thank you guys so much. It really is you guys that are the reason I'm able to do this as my job. I only have three patrons right now, but you know, the more that we get, the more money I'll be able to bring in and put towards equipment or my living space and actually be able to get more content out to you guys. Wanted to say thank you guys once again. I'm gonna start doing more patron content as the year goes by. I did take like two weeks off in the beginning of January just for like mental health reasons, but wanted to say thank you guys for being so loyal onto the Patreon. So if you guys haven't already, go check it out. And with all of that said, I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.